Beautiful art glass, Victorian items, mid-century modern silver, and a little bit of controversy. All of that is coming up in this video. This is the fun time of the month for me because I get to pick 20 items. I spend the whole month trying to pick and choose and curate what things we're gonna put on eBay and sell at auction. I really enjoy doing this because we get to do a deeper dive and talk a little bit more about the people and the circumstances surrounding how these wonderful, interesting, and sometimes strange objects came to be. Here we go with a, another flight. There are some really cool things. Let's take a look together. Our first offering is a lovely piece of bohemian glass, and this is quite an old piece of bohemian glass. You can see the nature of the pontal, and look at all that wear on the bottom. Now, this is a bottle that might have been used for cordials or scents or something at a certain point, but it has moved around over the years enough to have some real significant wear on the bottom, and that's because this is about 150 years old. And if you have something as old as this, well, then you are going to see visible wear marks, and you really should, even if it's an object that wouldn't have been moved a whole lot. They get moved for cleaning, they get moved for dusting, they transition from one house to another over time. So this is what old real wear looks like. It's a beautiful piece, and it reflects a few things about Bohemian glass that make it really special and interesting. Bohemia is a part of Czechia, or the Czech Republic now, uh, but it has been in and out of various kingdoms and monarchies and under the control of the Nazis, under control of the Soviets. So it's gone through a lot of upheaval, but one thing that has been pretty constant throughout is that they have been makers of fine glass for all of those centuries. And you see really wonderful glass made in Czechoslovakia, both in the antique and the modern era. Their main competition was Murano, and in the early days, they were better than Murano. They had lots of chalk and potash, and because of those chemicals, the glass had a real clarity, and that's why flashing decoration and painting decoration became a way to ornament it, because the glass was such good quality, you still wanted to see the clear glass and how easy it was to show light through it, or whatever fluid you put inside of this. By the 1870s and 80s, when this started to have a big revival in Europe, a lot of the dignitaries in the Persian and Ottoman empires thought it was quite fetching, and they started ordering it. And so shapes started to become more Middle Eastern looking. You see minarets like this, and lots of these nice low shapes, and then lots of hand embellishing. They were known for etching, which you see this has quite a bit of etching in the panels, as well as hand painting in this what would have been called back then rather naively orientalist style but it is very pretty and a lot of detail everything done by hand and the fact that this style then became popular in Europe and the United States as well really reflects how the world was getting much smaller. There was suddenly a lot more awareness. People were taking the grand tour between rail and steamship. You suddenly could go a lot farther, a lot quicker than you ever could before. And so styles and design started to really transmit from one culture to another. And so that's why I found this piece in, of all places, a Florida antique mall. The remarkable thing to me about this piece is that they're not terribly expensive now. We are starting this at $29. It's so nice to have something that is truly antique to start off the show with this time, because we find lots of really cool vintage stuff, but to be truly antique, you have to be a century old or older. Well, it's a little chilly even by Florida standards today, and so I decided to put on this coat, but this coat is actually going off to live in a new place. It is a men's large, but the significance is this right here where it says Nike. And interestingly enough, it is not the swoosh on the outside here. It does have the swoosh label in the collar though. This is an early 1980s piece. This belonged to my dad and I believe he got it around 1984 and used it for a couple of years on the sidelines while he was soccer coach. And that's all that it's been worn. He really liked this. He didn't wear it much. And my mother kept it ever after. 
And I would occasionally wear it when I came to visit her, and it was chilly outside in Florida, but it hasn't had much use because there's not too much use for a coat here most of the time. Nike has a pretty interesting past. It was the brainchild of Phil Knight and his track coach at the University of Oregon. His coach got the idea of experimenting with his wife's waffle iron and making soles that had a waffle bottom. It could adhere to a lot of surfaces with a lot of surface area that would not clog up with dirt so that you could maintain your traction. In 1971, they hired a Portland State University graphics art student named Carolyn Davidson. And for $35, they said, you need to come up with something that seems like a line that's in motion. And she came up with five different designs, and one of them was the famous Nike swoosh. But they didn't use it on everything at first. In fact, Phil Knight didn't even really like it at first, but he said, well, I'll get used to it. By the 1980s, the swoosh had become a part of the logo, but there were still some transition pieces and some throwback pieces, and that's why you do not see the swoosh on the outside of this jacket. When the company went public and started to do well, he presented her with 500 shares of stock, which were worth $85 then. They're now worth $4 million. So she ended up being very nicely compensated for her work. And she was very grateful for it because, as she said, you know, I told him 35 bucks and he paid me. He didn't really have to do that. So this jacket's 40 years old. I think it's a nice style. It's in good condition. There's an occasional little snag, like right here. You can see a tiny one. Uh, but everything works. It zips. <laughs> And I think it's a nice looking piece. I actually thought about keeping it in honor of my dad, but I remember talking to him about it back at the time and he said, yeah, I understand that they're saying this one's going to be valuable because it doesn't have the swoosh on the outside. So you guys should hang on to it for a while and then maybe it'll be worth something. So we're going to find out what it is worth. We are putting this out for just $9.99, no reserve, and we're going to let the market tell us whether this piece has maintained the collectability that it seemed to have back when it was made. My next piece actually came from my mother's collection. She didn't wear a lot of jewelry, but she had this in her jewelry box, and I just love it. It is Lucite. It is 1950s. It looks like one of the Friskies promotions, but it is a pin with goo goo googly eyes, as the song said. And that is where the notion of Google Eyes came from. Barney Google and Stuffy Smith are one of the oldest still-running comic strips in the Sunday Funnies. And Barney Google had big whites to his eyes. And in 1923, there came a song called Barney Google with the Goo Goo Googly Eyes, and Google Eyes became a thing. By the time this pin was made, around 1960... Google eyes were something that were applied to all sorts of things, everything from jewelry to little cotton balls that were made into little critters. This is nice because it is carved. It's also in great shape and the eyes do roll about, which is nice. The coloration on the tongue is in great shape. The pin back's in great shape. This was not worn very much. During the war, lucite became a big material for jewelry because it did not involve rhinestones or using metal, which were needed for the war effort. By the 1950s, these sorts of things were more considered amusing and just for fun or even for juvenile wear. Although this one's a little big for a kid. Just as cute as can be, I'm starting it out at $9.99 and we have a buy it now of $45, which is what carved pieces like this typically go for with the eyes. Sometimes they go even more, so that might be a deal for someone. I like to put a combination of buy it nows and some things that we're not really sure where the price is, we let run for the full auction so that we can get an idea of what the market is at a given time. A lot of people think that I'm taking a big risk selling some of these items on eBay. And in some cases, yes, we are just taking a shot and seeing what the market is for things that we are not seeing out in the market. And this next piece is a good example of that. We haven't seen any sell recently, so we don't really have an idea of where the price is on these now. But this is a really interesting, way ahead of its time piece. This is the Zerbi Rotating Toothbrush. And you see the patent dates, they date to 1937. Alfonso Zebri and his brother were both inventors in Bellefontaine, Ohio. His brother is actually known for this really cool tubular steel furniture called Tech Steel, which he patented. 
as well as this device, which was used in the Second World War by the U.S. Navy. But Alfonso had this in mind, and wow, was he ahead of his time. The rotating toothbrush is all mechanical. You crank it with this, and when it's cranked and it has a good charge, there is your rotating toothbrush. So no electricity required because in 1937, a lot of people still didn't have indoor plumbing, let alone electricity in a bathroom. This was a premium product. This cost $15 in 1937. It came with several heads that you could exchange so the whole family could use it to save a little bit of money. And they each had a different color in the background. This one only came with the original white. But for most families, even if you could exchange the heads and everybody could use it, $15 for a toothbrush at a time when a toothbrush cost about 25 cents was something that was just not in most people's budget. Now, it did sell at Macy's and Lord & Taylor and some of the bigger stores in New York. It was just starting to get its footing, and then the Second World War happened, and all the little gears and parts it took to make it do this suddenly were in short supply. And because of that, the Zerbi toothbrush did not survive the Second World War. It was so far ahead of its time, though, tests showed that it got rid of 3.5 times the bacteria that a manual toothbrush did. We're doing this at auction because we haven't seen one sell, and we're not seeing a bunch of comps out there. And when I see something that's unusual and scarce, I figure, well, we're going to let the market tell us. We're starting this at $49. If the right person who understands my fascination with this sees it, well, then it might go for $100 or more. And we shall find out together. Because one of the great things about doing these experiments is that you folks can follow along, uh, look at the eBay listings, and of course the links are in the description, so you can bid if the items are still available, but you can also go and check completed sales to see where these things end up in the marketplace. This next piece is a personal favorite of mine. I have always been partial to this particular chalice. This is made by Blanco Glass, and it was one of their very first designs by Winslow Anderson. Winslow Anderson was an amazing designer. He was the first in-house designer at Blanco. After the Second World War, Bill Blanco Sr. saw the opportunity to go up market if they had a designer behind this. So he contacted Alfred University in New York, which was very famous for its ceramic school. They said, Winslow Anderson is great. You should talk to him. So Winslow Anderson went from New York to this little town in West Virginia fell in love with it and decided to take the job and become Blanco's first in-house designer, even though he didn't have direct experience with ceramics because, like he postulated, well, ceramics and glass, they're all fluid. And he said, it only took me a few days watching them work with the glass to get the idea for what we could do. And that I, he just was off to the races. He made so many great designs. They tended to be very elemental and straightforward and simple by comparison to some of the later designs Blanco did with other uh, in-house designers. But this one is the Air Twist Chalice. So this is a very carefully controlled twist in the stem. That was something that had actually been developed in glass a century before. Air Twist is actually a rather old design idea, but it looked great in a modernist shape like this. Uh, this is a nice honey amber color. They made it in various colors in the 1950s. In 1950, Winslow Anderson won the Corning Museum of Glass Award for the bent neck bottles, which was a pretty amazing thing. He had done the bottles upright, and one day as he was working on a restyle, one of them slumped in the kiln and the neck bent. And he thought, that's a pretty neat design. And that mistake ended up being the award-winning Corning Museum art glass piece of the year in 1950. So Winslow Anderson's reputation was made and he started to be courted by a lot of other big companies. He ended up going to Lennox in 1953 and doing a lot of their designs in their dinnerware and porcelain tableware through the 1970s. He ended up moving back to Milton, West Virginia and spent the rest of his life there. So something about Blanco and that experience just really spoke to him. The Olympics take money to host, and of course the dirty secret inside the Soviet Union around 1980 was that the country was actually starting to do pretty poorly financially, and the Soviet rule was not bringing people happiness or prosperity. And because of that, 
The Olympics were intended to showcase Moscow's ability to compete in the world, to be a major player on the international stage, and to bring badly needed revenue. And one of the ways they were going to make that was by selling these coin sets. You see the Moscow 1980 Olympic design there. And lots of paperwork telling you about the wonderful set that you're getting. And it really is a beautiful set. There's two layers. These are 10 ruble and 5 ruble coins. 10 rubles in silver, which these are, is approximately one ounce each. And 5 rubles are about half an ounce, so you can tell the difference, the smaller versus the larger coins. Most of them depict events happening at the Olympics or the Olympic circle. One has the CCCP logo on it, and there are some that show various sites. You take that out, and here's another layer. And these, of course, were the summer games, so these are all going to be summer-related sports like rowing and bicycling and those sorts of things. 1980 was a time when the Hunt brothers were trying to corner the silver market, so the price of silver was going up, and the hope, of course, in Moscow was that they were going to benefit from this run-up in silver and that they were going to sell a lot of these sets. They sold some of them beforehand, and then they invaded Afghanistan. And in protest, the United States and 65 other countries refused to take place in the Moscow Summer Olympics. And that meant there were a whole lot of these that didn't get sold right away, and it did not produce major revenue for the Soviet Union. The boycott actually was very, very hurtful. It certainly hurt a lot of American pride, too, and there was definitely a controversy at the time over whether it was fair for our athletes to pay the price of missing the Olympics because of international politics. But, as we've seen, Afghanistan's a tough place to negotiate, and it turned out that the Afghan war pretty much took care of what was left of the Soviet Union's finances and helped lead to the undoing of the Soviet Union. So a seminal event in the Cold War as well. All of that makes this a pretty interesting set. And because it's silver proof coins, they're actually pretty valuable. This is about 20 and a half troy ounces of silver. And that means that it should sell for potentially several hundred dollars. And they usually do. Because of that, because I feel very confident in what this is. It is absolutely genuine. It sat at the bottom of a pile, so you can see that the cover of the box has had some wear and some impressions that are permanent. But because we feel very confident that they will find their right price, we are starting this at $9.99 with no reserve. I had the chance to pick up a few of these, and I find them so interesting. This is Esquire, the magazine for men. This was the men's magazine before Playboy came out. And they had some similar issues that Playboy ran into, in part because of their illustrator, Antonio Vargas. Vargas was Peruvian. He came to the United States in the 1920s, saw a lot of attractive women in New York, and said, I'm an illustrator. I'd like to draw pictures of pretty women, please. That would be a great job. But this one has all 12 pinups for 1944. Vargas did 180 paintings of women between 1940 and 1946 that were then reproduced as the Varga girls, as they were called. And it's the war, so we see patriotic themes. We see ballet dancers. We see women shown in all sorts of ways that definitely are about their pulchritude. We have the swimmer in the summer and the beachgoer in the summer. Vargas was not without controversy. Esquire and he had a parting of the ways in 1947, and they owned the name Vargas, so he had to sign everything A. Varga after that when he did prints on his own. So if it says Varga rather than Vargas, it's post-Esquire. In 1979, a Vargas pinup collector, who was the drummer in the band The Cars, got him to come out of retirement and do the cover for the album Candio, and that's why you see a Varga woman on the front of a 1970s New Wave album. The other thing that's interesting about Esquire, though, is you get to see the types of things that were being sold as gifts to men in the 1940s. The ad for being taller with shoe lifts, as some of our presidential candidates have been using lately. And because it's the war, of course, first among fine gifts are war bonds. 
But right across from that is an ad for the Zippo Lighter. They did a lot of early Technicolor advertising in this. These magazines heralded back to the early era of magazines where they were supposed to be beautiful and interesting to hold on to. And somebody did, and that's a great thing, because while a lot of these have long since ended up in a landfill, we have this one in perfect condition and none of the pinups removed. This is a really, really fun thing, and I'll have to lay it out and take a picture so you can see the full effect of it, because it's there's no way I can hold up all of these heavy mirrored panels and show you. The six panels together make up a wonderful wall plaque with the tiger. You can see the face there. It's by Hoyn, and Hoyn Scene Mirrors were a California invention in the late 60s and early 70s when people were looking for more naturalistic themes inside. Hoyne came out with the idea that we can do screen printing on the back of mirrors and people can hang them on the wall. And this is the original package. It's never been used. It still has its stick -em on the back. They got a patent for these sets around 1969 and they were very popular through the 1970s and early 80s. The other thing that Hoyne made a whole bunch of are the retro throwback advertising mirrors that you see from the 70s and 80s. They really got that trend started. They took an old Raleigh bicycle ad, for example, and printed it on a mirror, and that was a big success, and they got a patent for those in the mid-70s as well. So for a period of time, while this style was in, Hoyne was a big success. I don't know them to have made anything else. I think their fortunes rose and fell with these mirror scenes, which by the early to mid-1980s had become seen as being tacky and not of good taste, but they were really fun. And finding a whole set in undamaged condition that hasn't been used is not very easy to do because they were meant to be stuck to the wall, and then when you got tired of them, you scraped them off the wall and they broke while you did it, and that was the end of them. So utterly disposable, and most of them are gone. But a few people never put theirs together, and I was fortunate enough to find this one. We're starting it at $49, and we're just going to let the market tell us where it should sell. It really seems to depend on the image. I've seen images of horses that sold for over $100. I've seen several sets that sold in the $85 range. It really just varies so much, and the tiger has not been for sale lately. So, like I'm fond of saying, on eBay, just like anywhere else, if you have the only one, you have a good chance to sell it. This is something that is not the only one, but it's a fairly hard one to get. This is Fenton glass, and this color is Jamestown blue. This Jamestown blue is a steel blue color. Funnily enough, this was made in 1957 to 59, but 25 years later, I was at a prom and I was wearing a suit this color. So this color came and went in fashion and the 80s were the next time it came up. Well, by the 80s, a lot of people were collecting older Fenton and they started to realize there's not a lot of the Jamestown blue. Like a lot of the crested lines, of course, it has a crest on the edge, but this is cased glass. So the crest is white and the body is the color as opposed to most of the crest lines, which are the opposite. So this is a hard piece to find because this color is popular now and was in very short production during a time when the economy was not really good, so there wasn't a lot of it made. It does not have a Fenton mark because it predates that era of Fenton. But again, look at the edge there. It's not as worn as that Victorian piece, but you can tell this has been moved around a little bit. It's not a brand new piece of glass, and it is a cute style and a great color. And even though this is a fairly regular design for Fenton, the fact that it is this unusual color is what really makes it with the collectors. We are starting this at $29, but I expect it will probably sell somewhere in the range of $60, which is where I have the Buy It Now set. I want to thank my Level 2 and Level 3 members who get early access to this video because uh, whether it's on Patreon or on YouTube, the Level 2 and 3 members, their extra contribution is what makes it possible to take the time to present this to you. And I really appreciate their contribution because we get to eventually roll it out to everyone. But if you want to see things first, when they're first listing on eBay, you do have to be a Level 2 or 3 member. If you're not and you're interested, you can look below the dash line in the description of any video to find out more about memberships. This is a neat piece that recently became a true antique, and you can tell by the style of the lithography that it has some age for sure. 
It says, the spirit of Paul Jones, and they mean John Paul Jones, the Scottish naval man who started our U.S. Navy and was very successful at procuring supplies for the revolution by threatening and capturing British merchant ships. Well, by World War I, we are trying to get people to enlist and we are trying to make it look like we're doing very well so that you will go thinking of the glories of war rather than the desolation and decimation of war. It is really wonderful in terms of the color. This has been preserved on foam core for a long time, and so it doesn't have any bumping or rips or tears or any damage at all. It's in really good condition, and the graphics are quite stunning and very poignant for the time. The printer on this is E.J. Rhenish, and you see 1918. This is the last year of World War I. Rhenish was an American illustrator from Chicago, and he did a lot of patriotic work around the First World War. And a lot of his work, because he was in Chicago, and this is right after the Great Northern Migration, where a lot of black people moved from southern cities to northern cities in order to find more opportunity and hopefully fewer Jim Crow laws. He did a lot of work being in Chicago to cater to that new audience. His most famous and valuable print, which sells for around $600, is called Our Colored Heroes, and it shows Privates Roberts and Johnson in an actual scene from the First World War where they took on and defeated two dozen Germans during an attack by themselves. This piece is in great condition. It measures 16 by 12, and I don't know what this particular one should sell for because, again, I haven't seen this one sell recently, so... For someone who is interested in naval history or war history, or you just like airplanes, because there's a great biplane up in the corner there, well, this definitely shows the war theater in all of its glory. Speaking of glory days, well, this is a signed baseball, and that signature is Rod Carew, and it is a real signature. I do not have a certificate of authenticity. It would be too expensive to send this in and wait for that to come back for what the value of this ball is. So we're just going to sell it. I know the source it came from and I stand behind it. Carew was an interesting player. He was on the Minnesota Twins. He had played baseball in his native Panama mainly to get away from his alcoholic father. So he had some place to go and something to do. At the suggestion of his mother, he took up baseball to get out of the house. She eventually left Panama with Rod and came to the United States. It was his high school years, and he didn't play baseball. He didn't see that as his future, but he was a good player, and when he got out of high school, somebody convinced him to try out for the Bronx semi-pro team, and a scout for the Minnesota Twins saw him, had him do a tryout, and was so impressed he canceled the tryout halfway through because he said, yeah, we're going to pick you up, and we don't want anyone from the Yankees to see you. It's amazing to think how little baseball players made back then. His initial contract was $400, which is about $3,000 now per month. I don't think in this era that the water boy would work for $3,000 a month. But baseball was a different game then. It was, you were supposed to do it for the love of the game, and the people who made the money were the promoters and the owners, and you just got to play baseball. Rod Carew turned out to be really good. He was the rookie of the year his first season. He's one of only seven American League players to have 3,000 hits in a career, and in fact, their batting award in the American League is named after him now. There's an interesting story about Rod Carew. He married a Jewish woman and raised his three daughters in the Jewish tradition, but he did not actually convert to Judaism himself. And a lot of people have made that mistake, including Adam Sandler in the Hanukkah song, uh, who said that he converted. Not actually true. This does come with a nice little plastic cube to keep it safe and clean and is going to start at $49. We have a buy it now of $89, which is typically about where these sell. I just bought a wonderful collection, most of which are going to shows with me, but one of which had to go to show you because it's so sweet. These are little purse perfumes in guilloche with enameling and hand painting and they are just gorgeous. They are marked sterling, so it is sterling silver. This is going to date to about 1920, 
Fabergé really made guilloche very, very popular in the early 1900s. The way guilloche is made, you notice it has, if you look past the flowers into the yellow, you'll notice it has a texture. They use turning equipment, lathes, that create a geometric background in metal. And then they pour enameling that's translucent into it. So you can still see the design through the enamel, even though it gives it a lot of color. And then if they really wanted to fancy them up, they would hand paint them. They would trim them like you see here in the black, and they'd hand paint flowers on them. The flappers just loved these. And so did the Gibson Girl era. They are very sweet little boudoir collectibles. I bought a large collection here in Florida, and it's just wonderful to have these. You just don't see them come up very often on the market. It's not something you're going to typically find in a thrift store for sure. I have not actually ever owned the perfumes before. I've admired them in other people's cases for many years. So now I have a nice collection, and I wanted to share this one online with all of you. We are starting this at $49. Even though it's just a very little, pretty, itty-bitty thing, they typically sell closer to $100. So I will be curious to see whether the online market tends to do better for these or whether it's something that will sell better at shows. The race is on. Canada went through a lot of changes with its coinage in the 1980s. They got rid of paper $1 and $2 bills and replaced them with the loony and the toony. And they started doing a lot of commemorative sets to sell abroad. And this is a good example. This one, most of the coins are sterling. They're all proof. Most of them bear the regular information you would see. But at the top is a commemorative dollar in this set. And that commemorative dollar commemorates the 250th anniversary of the establishment of the first ironworks in New France back before it was part of Canada. This was in Troy Rivière, which is known by the English as Three Rivers in Quebec. The designs on the back show the mature Queen Elizabeth. This style was done from the 1968 introduction by designer Arnold Manchin up until the 2000s when they revised them to her elder image. So this one is where she is the most regal, wears the very fancy crown. It's what you see standard on Canadian coinage of the late 1900s. But the reverse for the special one at the top there was designed by Robert Ralph Carmichael. So oftentimes with coins, you'll see one side that was done many decades before the other side, and it will be two different designers involved. The larger denominations are silver in this set. We typically see sets like these sell for about $45. I do have a buy it now on this one, but we are just starting it at $9.99 again. I feel very confident with coins because they are so widely traded. Unless you have something that's really, really rare and significant, you can put coins on eBay and you're probably going to get, if there's silver value, about what you should no matter what you do. So to me, it's a no-brainer. You put it on at a low price, let people have fun, see who ends up with it, and I'm looking forward to sending this out to another collector. I collect Canadian coins as well, but I actually saved the one for the 100th anniversary of the founding of Vancouver because that's more relevant to where I've been in Canada. A lot of the costume jewelry that was made in this country was made up until the 1990s and later in some cases. This is a good example. This one is JJ. This came from my mother's collection as well. And JJ, which you see the mark on the back here, is something that you will potentially find in a thrift store because a lot of people do not realize that they quit producing about 15 years ago. And so this is no longer made. And they had a very good designer by the name of Alan Weimer, who did a lot of these whimsy designs. Some of them are specific to animals. There's a lot of cats. Some of them are very whimsical. Some of them have to do with professions. Uh, there's one for teachers, for example, and it has charms that dangle underneath with apples and a uh, little schoolhouse and books and things like that. Um, so they were really fun, and they were really designed with a late 1900 sensibility about ju costume jewelry being fun, but it is a nice older gold toning. It's not as brassy and shiny as the things that we see from overseas that are being made now. This family started this jeweler back in 1935, and it evolved to be the Johnette Jewelry Company, and that's the JJ mark that you're seeing. 
and the quality is really good. I'm starting this one off at $9.99. I typically see prices in the $20 to $25 range when these close, and I think this one is just so cute that I expect someone who is a cat lover will be our audience. This next piece is a truly beautiful, truly Murano bowl from about 1960 in what this company referred to as Alabastron. And if you could see it where I can with the light coming through it, boy, is it beautiful. You get all sorts of different colors. It is cased, so it's cranberry cased with white and then a clear layer. I just really love the way that this is very uniformly formed, the way that they've made it. It is a Murano piece. It is signed S. Puccini. Not to be confused. There you go. There's your mark. Not to be confused with the composer, of course, and not to be confused with Leonardo Puccini glassware, which is clear and is actually made in Germany. It's nice that this has the Puccini mark on it because we know this is a legitimate Murano company, and so there's no question about its origins. With all of the fakes being made in Murano, looking for signed pieces that are attributable really does make a difference. S. Puccini produced at least from 1948 into the 1980s. I've seen pieces that have an Art Deco style, Deco Revival mark from the 80s in a paper label that are marked S. Puccini. There's not a whole lot of information about the company now, though. And so because of that, it's really about the beauty of this piece, this alabastron, which is what they called this. They did a lot of things that look like alabaster in glass because alabaster is a very popular material that largely comes from Italy. And they were seeing a lot of the alabaster companies having success making figures and pieces out of it. And so they understandably thought, well, we'll do something like that in glass. And I think it just came out really beautifully. There are only about a thousand glass blowers left in. Italy now, and that's down from a peak of 6,200 in the 1950s. The Murano glass industry is really under a ton of pressure right now because of offshore competition, and about 45 or 50 percent of what you see that's new that says it's Murano is not. It is generally stamped with a little round red label, and it's something that they're making labels and peeling and sticking on things made in Asia and Eastern Europe, which is really a shame because honestly, if Asia and Eastern Europe are the places that modern art glass should be made, just make it there and take credit for it and build your own reputation. I don't understand why everything has to be a copy or a fake of something that was made before because there's lots of really wonderful examples of new art glass from Poland, for example, that are really nicely formed. So, in my opinion, if you're buying Murano, stick to older pieces because you're going to know that what you're getting is real. And this is definitely real. These usually sell for two to three hundred dollars a piece. And I am going to start this at a pretty high price because of that. I'm going to start it close to the 200 and see where it goes from there. But it is just a gorgeous big piece. The late 60s and early 70s were a time of immense social change, and as baby boomers became adults and started to question a lot of things about society, well, they loved comics as kids, so it made sense that they would love comics as adults if they were adult-themed. And that's why R. Crumb in 1968 came out with the first counterculture comic, and it was called Zap. This is issue number two from about 1970. Uh, Zap was definitely the prototype for youth counterculture comics, and the first issue strictly showcased R. Crumb. In the second issue, R. Crumb introduces us to other artists like Victor Macoso, who did a lot of the psychedelic posters for concerts in the late 60s, and Rick Griffin, who worked with the Grateful Dead and did various album covers for them. So a lot of really famous illustrators ended up working for Zap Comics. Zap Comics produced about 16 different editions over a period of two and a half decades, so less than one per year. And the original editions were kind of small, especially the first two. The first one only printed 3,500, and this one, which is by the original printer, they have been reprinted by other printers later, but this one is by Apex, which was the original publisher. It's gags, jokes, and cosmic truths. Fortunately, 
they were smart, even though they were selling it primarily initially in Haight-Ashbury area of San Francisco and through head shops and other places that only adults would go. They knew it looked like something that a kid might pick up. So they made sure and not put anything really extraordinarily naughty on the covers. But it definitely says adults only for a good reason, because a lot of this is, oh, some of it's sexual in nature. There's drug references. It's definitely of the counterculture of the period. And it is absolutely not about being politically correct at all. This is edition number two, a very hard one to find, especially in this kind of condition. These came from a collection, probably the largest counterculture collection in the country, and the collector is very careful about condition on these things. So this one is near mint, and I'm leaving it wrapped in the cellophane. Zap number four became famous because in 1973, there was a lawsuit over its distribution and the feeling that it was pornographic. And they pointed out, we're only distributing it where adults would seek this kind of thing. And the Supreme Court, as a result, changed the definition of obscenity to being that it was in the eyes of the local jurisdiction. So local jurisdictions could determine whether something was considered obscene rather than there being one definition on a national level. And their point was, we're selling this to young people in San Francisco who know what they're getting and want this content. And so they won. And Zap Comics got to continue to be produced. We are starting this at $100 because it's pretty hard to find, and they typically should sell for around 150 and up. So we're going to see how this one does. But if you are into counterculture stuff, this is absolutely... A prime example from the period. This is your brain if you're a rabbit. This is an actual chalkware brain model from 1954 and it is actually dated J.E. Mueller 1954 and that is the person who created this and it comes with everything you need to study the brain of Lepus. And there it is and it shows what all these wonderful lobes do if you're a rabbit. I got an entire collection of brain models from a former University of Kentucky professor, and he used these in the 50s when he was a student and then proceeded to use them as teaching aids into the 1960s until they started doing injection molded pieces that replaced them. It has a few chips because as he said, well, sometimes I'd point at something with the pointer and I'd chip it a little here or there. So it's definitely been used it is on a stand that talks about it being from Gerard Models, not to be mistaken with the toy company in Pennsylvania. This outfit was in Penfield, New York, and it was connected to the Ward Science outfit, which is still a presence and still makes scientific brain models and that sort of thing in injected molded plastic now. But at the time, you had to have chalkware because it was something where you could paint it and you could tell all the differences between the different layers at a distance. They also made things like those cool nuclei models and models of atoms and all sorts of really neat stuff. This is a little more of an oddity and really different. I have to say that I have not seen another one for sale since I got this collection 10 years ago and this one somehow was set aside and hadn't seen the light of day for a long time. And I thought, well, I've got to share the last one I have with our collectors, because if I'm not seeing these, you may never see one again either. Now, for some of you folks, you may be happy not to see any anymore, but it is definitely an oddity. And medical oddities and scientific pieces tend to do very well. These usually sell between $75 and $100. We're starting it at $39. And we'll see who wants to have fun with this. I don't think it's going to end up being in someone's Easter display, though. I have a friend who loves her Swedish heritage and loves these little guys and has a big collection. And she inspired me to try to find one to share with you. And this is a Dala horse from the town of Mora in Sweden. Dala actually is a shorthand for Dalarna where in central Sweden, where these originated. These first started to be done in the 1700s by woodsmen who would carve them for their children to play with during the long, cold winter months, and they were generally just monochrome. Well, by the 1800s, 
it became popular to paint these in all sorts of bright colors, similar to the toll painting on Swedish furniture or inside houses, because it was something that they had the skill to do. They were already doing that sort of painting for themselves, and because it was a bright, happy thing to share with your kids. Now, the oldest doll of horses typically have a different piece of wood laid in here, so instead of just being kind of canted at the corners like this is, it's actually visibly a separate section. This one is a 20th century piece. This orange color should date it to about the time that orange was really hot, around 1970. The painting varies depending on which house does it. There's several different people and families and small factories producing these now. This pattern appears to be associated with the Hemslöjd dollar production. You can tell by the different patterns where they came from. It's in good shape overall. It's got a little bit of wear on the hind leg that I should show for full disclosure. These really became popular to collect in America because of the 1939 World's Fair. There was a wonderful, huge dollar horse standing out in front of the Swedish pavilion. And because of that, 20,000 of these were then exported to the United States and sold, and that began dollar horse collecting in the United States. So there's a lot of collectors for them here as well. And why not? They're so bright and fun and whimsical, and they don't eat very much. We're going to start this at just $19.99. Uh, buy it now price would be somewhere in the 35 range. While we're in the Scandinavian countries, there is something that we've all probably seen, and for the most part, we disregard these days, because for a period of time between 1964 and the early 1990s, the market became flooded with Christmas plates from all sorts of companies from all over the world. Everybody from Francoma Pottery to German porcelain makers started doing annual Christmas plates. But that was because they saw the success that Bing and Grondel had with theirs. And Bing and Grondel were the originators of the first Christmas plate. Harold Bing started producing these in 1895. He made a very small group of them for the people who worked in the factory and some of their accounts. And they were popular. Harold Bing got Franz August Holland, a Swedish artist, to cut the plate mold to give it this texture. And that's why when you move it around, you see that there's different layers in different areas of the piece. And that way they could apply the slip differently and get a very dramatic scene. And this one is particularly dramatic. This is the lifeboats. This is 1932. Yule often means Christmas Eve. There is a tradition in Denmark that you give a plate of cookies to your neighbors on Christmas Eve. And the idea was, well, we should have a special plate to put them on. And these special plates became quite collectible. 1932 was the year my mother was born. It was the depths of the Depression. That means this one's relatively scarce. And while at one time this might have sold for over $100, they still should sell for $35 to $40, even though a 1972 Bing and Grandel plate might sell for as little as $4. So there is still a collector for these harder to find dates. There's your Bing and Grondel mark on the back. And there really is a lot that goes into them. Every year they have to hire a master carver to do this. The prices on the pieces made since the early 90s have actually gone up quite a bit because they have limited the production quite a lot. They don't make nearly as many of these as they used to. And actually, the 2024, if you pre-order directly from Bing & Grondel, is $145. So there are still some people who are really serious about collecting these. But I've noticed that if you have harder to find years, the early 40s when Denmark was taken over by the Nazis, those are hard to find. The late 1800s and early, early 1900s are hard to find. And the Depression era are hard to find. So... This is an interesting piece of something that you might see often and not think much about, but maybe this will make you reconsider. And that brings us to our last piece. And when do we want it? Now. This is a very important poster from the Civil Rights Movement. If you notice at the bottom, it was sponsored by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. This organization sprung out of the sit-ins in the early 1960s. The point was for it to be nonviolent, and so this is actually part of the march to Washington that Martin Luther King led. It's a very dramatic photo, and it was done by a fellow named Danny Lyon. 
And you can see Lincoln Lithograph Company, that is the original with the Union label. And over here on this corner, which is slightly bumped, this is in good shape, no tears or damage, but a little bit of bumping at the corners. But there you see Danny Lyon, he was the photographer. He was part of the new journalism movement and was a young man in 1962 when all of this was really starting to happen. I got this from the estate of a freedom writer. She was a seminarian in 1962, 20 years old, very naive, and the black churches of this house said, please come and help us. And so she got on a bus with a bunch of other people, figuring they were going to go down and help people sign up for the right to vote. She had no idea how harrowing it would be. Their bus was attacked. They were refused entrance to certain towns. They were threatened with their lives in various instances. And that was certainly the case throughout that part of the country during the early days of the civil rights movement. We all know that it turned out because eventually voting rights acts were passed, civil rights acts were passed, and there started to be the cessation of the Jim Crow laws. New journalism, which Danny Lyon was part of, is where you're actually, rather than just reporting, you're part of the story. And so he was part of the movement and was able to take these pictures because he was there and participating. In fact, he actually was John Lewis's roommate for a period of time. I actually have a couple more of these posters. John Lewis is probably the potentially most valuable one. It's in the best condition. I'm going to send that one hopefully to Sloan's auction in Philadelphia. They first exposed these on Antiques Roadshow about 10 years ago, and they typically are getting about two to 3,000 for each of these posters. This one is in good shape overall. Recent completed eBay sales on this are about $950 plus shipping and insurance, so into the $1,000 range. I do have a reserve on this piece because it is a rather exceptional photo print from an important period of American history, and they are very collectible now. Danny Lyon took photos for them in 1962. Harry Belafonte put up $300 so that he could go do it. And in 1963, because Danny Lyon was now considered something of a pariah by the folks who did not want to see these changes happen, they actually discouraged him from participating at that time for a little while. And then he took more pictures of the movement as the movement went on. So it's an interesting collection. He did a lot of other things later in life, and he learned a few things along the way. He got involved with a bunch of bikers and was taking pictures of them in the late 60s. And Hunter S. Thompson said, don't join those groups. Don't participate. Stay outside of that. And he didn't. And then he saw what some of the ugliness inside those groups were, including neo-Nazism and some other things, and he beat a hasty retreat from there. But he did some really interesting photography around that that's also very collectible. So Danny Lyon is definitely a name to look for in photography. And with that, well, now is the time that I have to go and take pictures of all these things so that you can see them drop on eBay as they list, if you are a level two or level three member on my YouTube channel or on Patreon. So if you are, well, we're very happy to bring these to you and let you see them first. If you're not, well, we are glad to share this with you anyway and very thankful for the level two and three members whose contribution makes this possible. Thank you so much for watching. Even as we are releasing this, we are starting to put aside 20 items for next month's drop of things on eBay. And we have some interesting stuff going aside right now. So look for our What Sold video next month to show you how these things did and then we'll have more for you. If you enjoyed this video, check out this one. Also click thumbs up to like this video and check the description for information about our Patreon, our memberships. We've got a lot of different levels with different perks and bonus videos and early content. Also, please do check out our website, theantiquenomad.com for appraisal help. And we'll see you again for more adventures in the antique and vintage community soon. Bye for now.